Hi guys, I'm not good enough to make this any shorter, I'm sorry. So over the years, there have been several attempts at explaining morality. Yes, it's about morality and how it relates to religion. And there have been several attempts using text, audio and video, all trying to explain it, but they didn't do it my way. And it's not beaten enough yet, as can be seen from the repeated usage of the word morality by religious apologists. So I thought I'd give it my spin. So Christians as well as Muslims on YouTube claim in never ending number of videos that atheists have no basis for morality which, after all, is presupposed to originate with their favorite god, and thus bypass these ignorant atheists. Since the search function in YouTube is hopeless, let me demonstrate using start page or ix quick or whatever, how many videos there are mentioning atheists and morality, or using their favorite term, which makes it sound more important, absolute or objective morality. Wow, sounds good, eh? Anyway, now, atheists don't believe that there is evidence for the existence of gods, and that is it. So there's no, no mention of morality here, but if you presuppose everything is based on your favorite god, well, then you might just have a point. So then you are attributing this not to atheists, but to humans in general. So out of the 30,000 odd results, you have hundreds, all showing how objective morality does not even exist, is disgusting, or justified. And they're all bringing their individual perspective and their own good or bad arguments for or against. So then, what is there left for me to do? All this watching, reading, searching has left me with a feeling that one holistic perspective is missing. One which superficially analyzes the claims, digs down occasionally, but provides only one thing, the impetus for further investigation and thinking. Now, if only a handful of people feel the urge to consult, shake Google and ask for information there, this video is already justified. So if you look at the topic of morality, you'll find a mountain of materials. Each aspect has a huge amount of subtopics associated with it, and each in turn has been covered by several books. So I acknowledge that a comprehensive video addressing all aspects is impossible, which is why I will cover the basics, you know, some definitions, claims, the results and the consequences. What we are confronted with is a whole series of claims made by Christians and Muslims alike. There are laws, both physical and spiritual, which in turn points to and requires a lawgiver. You know, the, the tired, primitive, painting needs a painter, building needs a builder. <clears throat> because a god created humans and is super clever, only this creator god can know what is good and right for us god worshippers. And then humans are fallible and tend to screw things up, so this creator god has decreed that there be a set of rules or divine commands which are not to be touched and represent the right way, the objective way. I mean, there are more, but this, this sets the scene quite nicely. The obvious question is, are these claims somehow justified? If I concentrate on Islam, you have several sentences on behavior in the Quran or the secondary text, the, the Sunnah, but there are very few specific commands or explanations. You can find that telling the truth, keeping a promise, showing respect to others, obeying God and Muhammad, not stealing, not killing, paying your debts, being humble, and finally displaying righteousness and piety are mentioned and are considered Islamic values. Plus, what you also get is an incredible amount of do's and don'ts when you're naked. But what you don't get, that is the prerequisite of morality, the consequence. All I see is do this or do that and you're on your way to get a reward. If not, beware of the punishment. But what I don't see is any reasoning, justification or the appropriate, adequate and fair punishment. Just obey. Now, because Muslims are not allowed to think and act independently, they require guidance. This is, this is likened to a person with perfect vision in a dark room who can't see in spite of his perfect eyes and thus requires a beacon to direct this person in the right direction. Muslims are unaware that there's a light switch by the door because humans have since discovered electricity. 
So what are all these words telling a human being? Is being pious better for a human than eating a baby? Well, according to Islamic texts, yes. They don't mention a whole lot of things and leave it up to the individual to establish the well-being of himself or the tribe or mankind as a whole. So what exactly is this well-being translated into? Well, we know that in general, life forms tend to avoid pain and strive towards well-being. Do we know and can we define well-being? Is well-being different in Islam? For, for a sadist, inflicting pain increases well-being. For a pedophile, fondling a child increases well-being. So are inflicting pain and fondling a child moral or maybe even objectively moral actions? If I donate money to a charity, is this ethical or altruistic? If I tell another person the truth about their bad medical condition, am I the cause for the emotional distress? Should I have lied? Is it moral or not? Is, is lying of a higher moral value than telling the truth? So the words we see here in connection with this are objective, ethics, morality, altruism and values. What are all these? How can we evaluate them? So let, let's start with the easy one, objective. So according to Merriam-Webster, it's based on facts rather than feelings or opinions or in philosophy outside of the mind in the real world. Dictionary also says not influenced by personal feelings or interpretations or prejudice or intent upon dealing with things external to the mind. So what is strange is there's nothing here on divine commands. What we do see, however, is that because all normal life forms try and avoid pain, the person inflicting pain, whether emotional or physical pain, is objectively wrong. So what about ethics and morals? Well, ethics are rules laid down by consensus and morals are more about what we feel when we do something. So for a peace officer performing a same-sex wedding, it might actually be ethically right and morally wrong at the same time. If we look into this a bit deeper, we can find dilemmas and inconsistencies when it comes to the religion-based objective morality. Like a, a German 80 years ago, lies to a Gestapo officer that he's not hiding any Jews. Is he morally wrong for lying or morally right for saving lives? At this moment, a child sneezes, causing the Gestapo officer to search the room and he finds three Jewish kids hiding behind the sofa. Following his oath to follow the Führer and his patriotism, his ethics command him to turn them over. His morals command him to let him go and his altruism commands him to hand some of his own stamps to them so that they can get food. What does he do? So there are different levels to this and an unimaginable degree of, of complexity. And then what about altruism? Does it belong here? It's, a, it's the unselfish concern for the welfare of others. So no, it's only about selfless concern and already presumes a positive attitude. If there, if there were a set of laws which would be representative of objective morality, shouldn't there be a direct and precise answer in Islamic texts indicating exactly what this God wants his subjects to do? It seems, however, that all we get are some general guidelines, I mean, the same what we could find in Moby Dick or The Lord of the Rings or any other thicker well-written book. What this demonstrates is that moral values are dependent on situation and context, independent and not requiring any gods. We humans don't judge a lion eating babies, it's natural. We don't expect birds to prostrate before us if we put up a bird pool in summer or a bird house with some food in winter. But we do honor people with little badges if they perform well in battle, while honoring those who avoid those very battles with peace prizes. We are not quite there yet, it seems. A minute ago, I stated that a person inflicting pain, like a sadist, is objectively wrong when doing so to another human being. So why do Muslims think that if their God does it, it is 100% right? How can something be morally wrong while being right if performed by someone else? What is this morality? Well, 
First off, we have causes and effects. So over the years, humans have developed a set of values which allow us to recognize the effect a specific cause has. And we've learned that sticking a needle into another person can be beneficial if done in a medical context, a prank if done gently, and totally horrific if used in torture. This means we have, we've realized that causes are contextual and depend on who is doing what and why. This has no absolute definition. That means that objective morality is flawed right from the start. But are there values or commands which are universal? Well, not eating babies would be, I guess. But that does not figure, for example, in Islamic texts. Condemning torture, genocide, rape, slavery, just to mention a few, I guess. But those don't figure either. So now we already have two huge problems. We have a God commanding his people to be good and then does exactly the opposite. This divine command theory proposes that a cause is considered as morally good when and because it is commanded by a God, as described in Plato's Euthyphro Dilemma. And I can see the consequence of this when Muslims frantically scramble to find reasons to reject pork. It's, it's quite hilarious, actually. Then we have the second problem that the divine command theory also proposes that a cause is considered as morally good when it is commanded by a god, even though the execution is the opposite of what was previously commanded. So what we learn when investigating Islam is that it, it says in the holy book, the noble and glorious Quran, that all humans are equal in the eyes of this god. And then this very God decides that the male half is just a little bit more equal than the female half. Um, some humans can be owned by others like objects. Do believing Muslims consider their God worth worshipping and morally sound if the Quran mentions slavery something like 29 times in the Quran alone and 13 times telling Muslims what to do with slaves? and that a slave is, is freed as punishment for the owner or maybe a reward for a good slave, where female slaves can be used for sex without consent, more commonly known as, as rape. Legally, does the Quran prohibit slavery per se or across the board? No, it even spells out the lawful usage of female sex slaves, where it says, um, you know, pr prosperous are the believers who abstain from sex except with their spouses and slave girls. The practice of carnal relations is lawful with them. Yusuf Ali makes this a little bit more difficult. We, you know, he says, who abstain from sex, except with those joined to them in the marriage bond or whom their right hands possess. For in their case, they are free from blame. So the way this topic is described in Wikipedia, for example, demonstrates sheer intellectual bankruptcy in my eyes because Muslims try to tone down slavery and make it look as though Islam was and is a positive experience for slaves. Is it, is it a virtue in Islam to deceive others to make your belief system look better than it is? They don't, they don't treat the topic honestly and acknowledge the moral failings of the past. Instead, the Quran tells Muslims they are the best of the nations and the righteous and to fight for their God. This has led to the attitude of supremacy, which in the past has wiped out entire tribes, political and cultural groups, and today has them establish Muslim-controlled zones in cities. Does the Quran prohibit or even condemn genocide? No. Wife beating is condoned in the Quran. And if we go through secondary texts, we find explicit instructions on how to rape female captives. In Scandinavia, the Muslim population is below 5%, yet most rapists are Muslims. Jails across Europe are being filled by Muslims. Are they not getting the message? Or is there no such thing as objective morality built into humans? Does it, does it help to look at the definition of morality, which is a, a code of conduct put forward by society, or given specified conditions would be put forward by rational, persons. So we see the same again what we have deduced by merely observing human interaction. What about objective morality, which has been discussed through the centuries by philosophers? Actually, philosophers themselves are not sure whether objective morality actually exists. So 
In philosophy, I think by now everyone on this planet has heard of moral dilemmas. Like when letting the train run will result in five deaths, but then pushing the button will kill only a single person. What will you do? There are those who choose the don't get involved option, by the way, but they are rare. Most people will select the kill less people option, letting the train kill one person rather than five. I mean, it seems right intuitively, but what if I replace the single person with Hitler? Will that change the outcome? What will happen if I replace the single person with Mohammed? Will that change the outcome? What will a Muslim now choose? Does Islam and his God give him an objectively moral guide? No? Why not? Well, it's easy. Because there is no objective morality in the sense that a God will provide an answer to every situation in our brain. Because we are not created and programmed by a God. Thank God. So, how can we come to terms with this difficult and complex topic? Let, let's, let's try a different approach. Maybe only indirectly, but we all know of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This concept was translated in logical structure of objectivism into four basic categories. So we have the, the material, the spiritual, the social and the political needs. And these are then um, given examples with, with, with health, friendship and so on. So this shows how the moral effects and values are built around our basic needs. So there's a need for objective morals? No, not really, because this is the foundation on which morality is built. We don't call a house a house on a foundation, because we know that a house has a foundation. The same is true for the foundation of morals we use in our lives. This is the foundation. And based on this foundation, we have biologically and instinctively developed behavioral patterns and values within these categories, which we consider as the norm, the moral norm within our cultural groups. We can actually check our behavior and see its origin in the basic needs table above and check if the consequences represent the desired outcome. Due to the modifications of these needs over time, some people reject all meat while others reject pork and others reject meat which comes from an animal which was not pointing the right way or was not given a speech before killing it. But now we are able to evaluate such behavior and link it to a basic need or not. So some people reject education which is not contained in a specific book. This can be linked back to the second basic need and shows that it is not a sound moral decision to do so. Some groups reject friends within other groups. Same procedure as above will lead to a result. So some groups can't handle personal freedom and prefer a life on their knees. Some groups will throw homosexuals off a cliff. Some groups will throw stones at people until they die if they attempt to leave their group. And some groups will kill anyone caricaturing their idols and gods. Which of these actions represent any form of sound, objective, beneficial morality. I mean, eating food is objectively right, but eating pork or shrimps is not? Come on. So, taking the logical structure above, we have here a very rational explanation of what morality represents and how humans form their decisions and what the consequences are. This way, we are establishing an explanation which takes us away from the childish prohibitions of what a, a person should be allowed to eat or how long with whom and in what position we are allowed to have sexual encounters. And this explains why Muslims and atheists, as well as members of every other group, all behave in a similar manner. None of them or us will eat babies but take care of them. This means that Muslims are actually better than their God. We will help and support each other in difficult times and even display altruism occasionally. Because we have a clash between parts of our brain, we are inherently irrational and can even become violent. But in general, we all exhibit very similar behavioral patterns in our social lives. It's just a pity that religions need to come along and spoil this, introducing their divisive dogma. 
Now, this does not mean that every human is intrinsically good. There are psychopaths. I'm, I'm not denying that at all. But we know how to morally grade them. And now, look, looking at religions, let me re reiterate the old Sam Harris challenge, which was made so popular by Christopher Hitchens. Name a morally beneficial action or a morally beneficial statement that a Muslim can do or make that I, as an atheist, can't. Good luck. In the last 30 years, the best any theist could come up with is prayer, a monologue without any consequences. And this demonstrates two things. Muslims are better than their God and their texts. Atheists live with similar, if not identical, built-in morals as everybody else. What we disagree over is the origin of these rules. Well, I've shown that we derive these through biology, nature, evolution, and Muslims believe they are custom programs for each individual by a programmer creator. Now, as an atheist, secular humanist, agnosticist, rationalist, skeptic, free thinker, etc., I'm free to differentiate between rational and emotional. Where a male human being and a female human being are free to engage in sexual activity of any kind, as long as it's consensual. Even if they are siblings or other relatives. I find it emotionally disgusting and biologically wrong, but rationally, why should I condemn this? Muslims criticize me for this, yet condone the very same thing when it is written down in their Quran, or when it is a 54-year-old man and a 9-year-old girl, but only when it involves their idol Muhammad. Now that I find reprehensible, dishonest, hypocritical, and applying double standards. Is it also immoral? Well, you judge for yourself. Thanks for your time.